You might think that Southern California and the Los Angeles area in particular is the mecca of cosmetic surgery. And you would be mistaken. On a per capita basis, the amount of plastic surgeons, board certified plastic surgeons in the Los Angeles area doesn't even make the top 20. The top one is really Miami. But in addition to that, there's Atlanta, Dallas, San Francisco, Sacramento, Baltimore, Seattle, Washington, Fresno, California, Columbus, Ohio. The point being is that cosmetic surgery is popular everywhere, and there are excellent cosmetic surgeons throughout the globe. However, within the Los Angeles metropolitan area, in the tiny little city of Beverly Hills, and within the small enclave of that city with a resident population of only 32,000 people, you'll find the highest concentrations of plastic surgeons in the world. When you add on the other surgeons who practice cosmetic surgery, like facial plastic surgeons, ENTs, dermatologists, ophthalmologists, there are approximately 550 cosmetic surgeons in the Beverly Hills Golden Triangle, the area between Santa Monica Boulevard, Wilshire Boulevard, and Cannon Drive. That's an area that's only four-tenths of a square mile. With that type of competition, to stand out in Beverly Hills, you have to either be outstanding or have a strong media presence. Sometimes the promotion of a procedure or the practitioner themselves outweighs their excellence. Fortunately, today on Beauty and the BS, we have Dr. Jubin Gabay. Dr. Gabay is a plastic surgeon who has both a presence and excellence. He's not shy about t telling us what distinguishes the good from the bad, what works and what does not work. And he's also not afraid to say a little bit about the good, the bad and the ugly of cosmetic doctors promoting themselves in the media. Dr. Jubin Gabay was raised in Beverly Hills and is deeply rooted in that community. His pre-surgical education uh, was in both cutting-edge microbiology as well as uh, practical and theoretical arts. Dr. Gabay's philosophy uh, continues to be that the approach to patient care is a comprehensive one. Uh, his insistence on excellence ensures that patients receive proven treatments and techniques to enhance features that are natural lasting, uh, as well as giving beautiful results. Jubin, thanks for, so much for being here today. Wow. I don't think I've ever heard anyone sum up the Beverly Hills and plastic surgery community better than you. Thank you. <laughs> thanks for having me. Well, you know, it's 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 a pleasure to have you here because you're one of the guys who who really kind of elevate the the caliber of Beverly Hills and 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 give it kind of both the style that people look for but back it up with quality. And that as I mentioned in my intro isn't always the case. There's just an enormous amount of media uh both uh self-produced media as well as just interest in Beverly Hills around the world that tends to have the practitioner want to promote themselves. And really what you've been able to do is promote yourself through your practice. And one of the things that I want to get into today is talking a little bit about how you, you were able to merge your interests in art and science to become a plastic surgeon. So tell us a little bit about your background. Amazing. Thank you. Well, um, you're correct. I grew up in Beverly Hills. Um, I definitely had, I think, a firsthand exposure to both the plastic surgery community and really the communities that supported uh, our community for so many years. So it was a great uh, upbringing to get me here. Um, my dad is an architect, a prominent architect in town, and that definitely was something that was super influential in making me who I am the person today. I was interested in architecture, and fortunately through my dad, I was able to realize it's an incredible art and an absolutely horrible profession. So I was uh, compelled to shift myself somewhere else. And, you know, like a good immigrant boy, I said, hell with it, I'll be a doctor, right? Um, 
it was through my medical school education and experience that I realized, wow, I could, I could really have the same uh, sort of artistic gratification, but also really that scientific uh, beauty in a career. And um, it led me to plastic surgery. Now, you know, I kind of joke with people that my dad and I pretty much do the same thing. We just use different materials. And here we are. You know, it's interesting when you mentioned that architectural background, because oftentimes I will lecture to people that if you are really just, you know, putting some spackle and some paint on something, you're really not going to have something that's going to be long lasting. The foundation is what really matters. And in order to really be able to have a good aesthetic outcome, your entire body has to be healthy and you have to focus on overall good health and overall structural support to your tissue in order to have long lasting results. And some of these superficial procedures that are commonly out there are, are appealing, but not necessarily long lasting. So tell me with your architectural background, I mean, how did, how have you been able to kind of incorporate that into your practice? Peter, in more ways than, than I think you can imagine, you say so many important things. First of all, one thing that's so important is, is looking at people comprehensively. And as you say, you've got to be healthy to go into one of these procedures. The, the worse material you have to work with, the worse the product is going to be. So that's number one. Number two is that, like I would say an architect, or an artist or someone, you have to look more than just at one small thing at hand. You have to look at the global picture of what you're working with. And that extends to both the, let's say, small anatomic area you're working to, with, to the bigger person, to even their sort of global position in life and what's important to them. Um, finally, and I'll tell you probably most architecturally, uh, you have to look at structures. And I mean, I, I've started to realize that so many of the procedures we do use the same structural principles in architecture as they do in body. Um, I think some of the biggest advancements in plastic surgery have come from this structural understanding of the body. I mean, we'll, we'll talk about it. But, um, you know, one of the questions you talked about is this deep plane facelift or, or in a tummy tuck, there are certain layers of the body that have better strength than others. And we've learned that by by identifying and utilizing those strong layers or the right layers and modifying them in the best way, that's how you get the best and most long lasting results. We know because we've both been practicing for a while now that within our field, what, uh, what comes around goes around. Uh, things come and go and then come back again. Uh, some of the pressures that we have as practitioners come from uh, trying to keep up to our uh, colleagues who may promote something. Some of it may be pressure because uh, the media attention has been high on it. And so there's patient interest. And sometimes that interest is so high that when we're really candid with ourselves, uh, from an economic standpoint, we don't want to lose out on doing procedures that others might be. Um, and there's a tough balancing act between doing what you feel is the right thing for patients, uh, versus doing things that uh, that may not uh, help them as much. I think most of us uh, follow the Hippocratic uh, oath. You know, first, you know, do no harm, and we, none of us really ever go into wanting to do harm to somebody. But sometimes, if we're really honest with ourselves, there may be procedures that we have done that says, I don't really know if this is going to help this person, but they want it. So I'm going to give it to them. And it takes a lot of, uh, a lot of courage uh, from a practitioner to say, no, I'm not going to do this. How do you, how do you find yourself telling your patients, no, I, I'm not, even though you know, when you're in Beverly Hills and you're in uh, the, this 
enclave of the most densely pa uh, packed plastic surgeons, that that person's going to go somebody else. And you're going to not just lose the person for that procedure, but lose that person for all of the procedures to follow. Mm -hmm. Tell us how, how, how you justify that in your own mind. Well, that also has been an evolution. And um, we've all heard this phrase that usually the academic guys who trained us would say, and that is, you never regret the case that you haven't done or the case that you turned away. And that's kind of bullshit, actually, if I may, if I can throw out the first bullshit here. Um, because, <laughs> you know, and I don't tell me if I can't say these things. Um, Please do. Yeah, that's thank the... you. So, so obviously, in one regard, that's very true. And I absolutely pride myself on telling people no when it is appropriate. And I think that's the first step in being an ethical and proper uh, physician. So, so first things first, if something is wrong, you got to say no. Now, then you start to learn people and you start to learn the profession. And while if someone comes to you and says, I want lipo, and I, I, I feel big and uncomfortable and I don't like how I look. And so you have to give me lipo because that guy's going to give me lipo. And you tell them, look, the problem is, let's say, loose skin. And the solution is a tummy tuck. Um, so that's kind of where we have to go. You start learning that we deal with human beings. And the most important thing about having a relationship with human beings is exactly that, having a relationship with them. So my my approach to someone like that that I would have to say no to is to try to understand them, to try to talk to them, to connect with them. And if I can get both of us to a place where, hey, maybe this alternative is the right option for you, let's go down that road. But at the same time, if you start to see all sorts of red flags and unrealistic expectations and just things that you know are not going to go in the right direction, you got to say no. And I think we've all made the mistake of convincing ourselves, no, it's okay, it'll work out in this person and um, everything will be all right. And usually it's not if you, if you really have to convince yourself to do the wrong thing. And again, I can give you very specific examples of times like that, that I absolutely regret it. I think that we have to, again, find that balance. Uh, we have to learn to say no. But I think we also have to recognize that we are in a dynamic profession and new things come along all the time. And if we're going to stay uh, on top of our game, particularly uh, when the consumer is so much more educated now through all of the uh, pathways of uh, knowledge for someone interested in plastic surgery, we've got to keep on top of it as well. And we need to recognize that uh, there is going to be some new technology or some minimally invasive technique that has merit. But like so many things, um, when you have people pushing things for economic gains, which look, that's what this business of cosmetic surgery is. Sometimes the hype uh, is uh, uh, greater than reality. And, and I think we see that a lot with certain technologies that have come through to us. Um, I think there's a lot of really great technologies that are out there right now. Uh, and I think that uh, I, I, you'd feel the same way. Sure. But there are some that probably aren't uh, aren't hitting the mark. Are, 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 there, are there any technologies that you've used over the past oh ten years or so that you're you're not using anymore because you found that you know what it just it just didn't do what I had hoped it would? Absolutely, and I will tell you, it's one that we have both used together. Um, I was looking back at our text thread and I saw, oh my god, in 2016. I was chatting with you about a technology called Sculpture. Um, Sculpture came on the scene on the tails of another technology, which I want to talk about, uh, Cool Sculpting, which is a non-invasive 
fat reduction technology. So something you go into someone's office, they put some pads or something on you, it does its magic, supposedly, you go and then in a matter of weeks or months, you have less fat on, let's say, your belly than you did before. So cool sculpting was probably the first effective technology that came on the market. And that subject became really hot. And, you know, I wanted to get sort of the best competitor of cool sculpting, which at the time was another technology called sculpture. So cool sculpting freezes fat. Sculpture would use energy or lasers to theoretically bust up fat cells inside and make your, um, your body literally pee the fat away. Um, well, after years of convincing myself that it worked, I realized it mm -mm, doesn't work well. It doesn't work. It, at best, it doesn't work well. And more often than not, it just didn't work at all. Um, so, you know, in, in that, I learned to make lemonade out of those lemons because fortunately I have a really body contouring heavy practice and I was able to speak with the people who came to my office and really as I started to approach this I realized it wasn't working I told them that I was honest with them about hey listen I've got this machine and if you are insistent that you do not want anything that even comes close to a you know procedure yeah, we can try it, but otherwise we're going to have to consider X, Y, and Z. And uh, little by little, it's there. And I mean, now I'm I, I'm just trying to figure out what to do with this, you know, two hundred thousand dollar things just sitting in my office. So that's one. The other, though, and I do think it's so important to talk about it because what an evolution is cool sculpting. Um, like I said, cool sculpting came onto the market fast and hard, and people loved it. Everyone would freeze the fat. It was the mantra. And for so many years, people were doing it. And there were people literally made their careers out of this technology. And we started to realize that, um, well, it would work. And that's, that's good. In some cases, it would have a modest reduction in fat, which was, I think, really attractive. The problem was that with that came a lot of very serious complications that for the most part were pushed under the rug and i think now little by little are you know it's just you can't really um ignore it anymore the the most common one that we see is called paradoxical adipose hyperplasia where uh, rather than reducing fat in someone's body it actually increased the bulk and they called it adipose hyperplasia, meaning technically it's a it's an increase in fat, but actually it's worse than that. It's really more um, this horrible scar reaction where you get a lot of tissue that is not fat and that is very difficult to get rid of. And I work very hard now on a lot of people uh, who've gotten this from other other places to fix that. And it's not super easy. So that's one. It often would cause nerve damage. I've had patients who had it, you know, on their arms and their uh, funny bone nerve, the, the ulnar nerve got dinged and their pinky was numb for over a year. Um, some people need long-term pain medication. So a whole host of stuff that, you know, came out of a technology that certainly was well-meaning, but definitely was marketed like crazy because could make a lot of money and it did make a lot of money yeah i uh, uh who wouldn't want a device that you just strap on your body for 45 minutes and your fat starts to melt away and that was the cell for initially cool sculpt and as you mentioned they did remarkably well uh, with that and those people who got in early were doing very well you know in their practice with it but that's when you started seeing some complications and even though the the practice did very well. The results at best, I think, were modest. And so I, my mea culpa moment here is I got kind of you know, attracted to the heating aspect of it, the mm -hmm. sculpture. I got into it, talked to the vendors. They sold it to me. I wanted to believe it would work. And I, you know, it's like, um, you know, it's it's like the emperor's new clothes. They would show me, look how good this is. And I go, yeah. I guess if they see it, <laughs> maybe I'm just not seeing it. But Absolutely. but what's even worse is I started promoting it to other surgeons like yourself. And, I've, and over time, I just felt worse and worse doing that. 
couldn't push it to my patients. And its sculpture itself is almost non-existent right now. You can't sell that machine back to the company. They yeah. will not take that machine yeah. back. So it sits as a very expensive coat hanger in one of our uh, closets right now. Um, and unfortunately, I think this, some of the complications, as you mentioned, with cool sculpting have made that less appealing than it was four or five years ago. But what it did do is is kind of open up the minds of uh, entrepreneurs, of scientists, of, of uh, physicians to thinking about, okay, this may not have worked great, but are there uh, less invasive, uh, less traumatic uh, procedures other than liposuction or a tummy tuck to do body contouring? And in doing the body contouring, can we also make the skin a little tighter. Uh, tell me, are there any body contouring technological devices that you feel have merit today? And I emphasize Wait. today because we may not feel that way tomorrow. Yeah, you're. Oh my God, you're you're so right. And yes, we are absolutely. We're we're at a clear moment in the evolution of this. I'm going to say actually one thing I, I love that you said was that cool sculpting opened the eyes to surgeons, to to doctors and scientists. I'll tell you the other great thing it did was that it opened the eyes to sort of the more general community about the concept and desirability, if you will, of body contouring. You know, it made people comfortable with the idea of saying, hey, I've got this thing and I want to take care of it. So in, in a large part, it was great in opening up a conversation. Um, and I, I really do appreciate that about the, at least the technology or certainly their marketing. Now, with regard to um, skin tightening, because I think that is truly the holy grail of uh, body contouring and plastic surgery right now. It's something we've been chasing for years and people have tried so many things. Um, years ago, laser lipo was the, the hot thing. They did another beautiful uh, marketing job with uh, smart lipo saying that this is great for skin tightening. It wasn't. Uh, at best, it was minimal. Um, in the last couple of years, there were two technologies that came out that have similar uh, or it's the same technology, just different applications. One is body tight, and the other is Renuvion, or it came out initially as J-Plasma. Um, now, those are technologies that still have to go underneath the skin. So they generally do require some sort of an invasive procedure, albeit usually very minimally invasive, and they're showing better results, but it's still anecdotal, I think. There's not a lot of great science behind it, um, and some, I think, are better than others, and I think in the hands of some surgeons, some are better than others, meaning the application, the usage of the device is also important. So um, body type first came on the market, and I think it's kind of, fall I don't want to say fallen by the wayside, but it's definitely less popular because I think Renuvion has emerged as a more powerful technology. Um, you know, full disclosure, I use Renuvion more. I have no interest in the company or anything like that, but I, I do think it works really well. Um, so that's sort of the semi-invasive technology. The stuff that doesn't have to go under the skin is still just not where we want it to be. I think um, devices like Morpheus or Profound are probably the hot topics right now. These are um, they're microneedling devices that similarly use radio frequency energy to try to affect the skin. And there's a lot of controversy, I think, among the guys and uh, everyone who uses it to say, well, does it tighten skin or not? Um, and there's no good science behind it. And we've just started using Morpheus. And I will tell you that I have an honest conversation with my patients that I do feel that it improves the quality of the skin, which may appear as a tightening effect, but I can't say, hey, it's going to be a facelift. Hey, it's going to be a tummy tuck. It doesn't work that well. But we're getting there. So I'm going to yeah. have to get... <laughs> So Renuvion is one of these hot topics right now, which, uh, which is this new, more powerful device, but again, goes underneath the skin, heats the tissue up and creates some contracture, or contraction rather, uh, and uh, ultimately with the idea of building up collagen and elastin, which is what 
the radio frequency energy uh, of body tight it is also supposed to do but for those who use renuvion they're they're very impressed with the power that that has i haven't any experience with it so you and i are gonna have to talk offline and let me know more sure. about it um my i do use body tight face tight, neck tight, they're all the same company. InMode makes this product that uses this radio frequency energy. And like you said, the data is anecdotal. And by that, it is very difficult to be able to see, tell somebody quantitatively how much improvement they're going to get. And I tell my patients, look, this is a catalyst for your body to do the work. And I can't tell you how much it's going to work. I do Tell you, I, I do see in my pre-op and post-op photos improvement, and that's what I will share with them. But I said, I cannot guarantee that you're going to get the same result as this patient did. And that's tough because if you're doing something a little bit more mechanical, uh, pulling something uh, with your hands, you can, you can judge how much you're moving something. The other problem with a lot of these technologies, particularly in this Amazon world that we live in. We want it now. Yeah. We want to see the results right away. And with the radio frequency energy, uh, and I assume with Renuvion, and you'll let me know, uh, again, as a catalyst to get your body to do the work, your body to form more collagen and more elastin, theoretically, uh, that doesn't just pop out as soon as you do the procedure. And it can take months and months and months. And people have to be patient, which is not... Uh, which is not a virtue that's always available. I I absolutely agree. Um, I have seen some immediate results with Renuvion, but for sure I have the same conversation, and I I tell people it's going to take a year sometimes. Um, and and same actually, funny enough, I tell them I I feel that it works, but it works differently on different people. It even works differently in different places on the same person. So, you know, there is a, a lot of variability. Now, I think maybe a positive of that is that if you do it this way, it can be self-selecting to your patients in the sense that, you know, if you're really honest with them, you're going to get patients who sign up for it that are patient and that will accept um watching an evolution of this rather than, you know, someone who's like, what do you mean? I want to be in a bikini in Cabo in two weeks. You can't tell me it's not going to work. So this speaks to, I think, the, the relationship that you have to have with someone if you want to use one of these less than perfect technologies. Uh, and I think that a lot of our, our patients just really need to understand that predictability is not something that we can always guarantee with technology. And mm -hmm. that's, that's, that's kind of the negative about it. But having said that, the continual progression of tools that we have uh, in front of us now is, is very impressive. And I think it will continue to be impressive as time goes on. We just need to just not necessarily get sucked into all the hype. Right, right. Um, on our show... <laughs> We have a segment called Beauty and the BS, and since there's a whole lot of potential uh, beauty or BS, I'm going to start laying it on you right now. One of the things that, that uh, are, are, is common uh, in, in our field uh, of cosmetic surgery here uh, is breast implants. And a lot of times the shape of the breast or the des desire of a breast is... Uh, influenced by uh, celebrity, influenced by media. And the oversized breast implants, the very large breasts, tell me your feeling about that. Is that. Do you consider that beauty? Do you consider that BS? Do you find that a problem? Do you find it perfectly acceptable or somewhere in between? No perfect answer, and it is variable from person to person. I do tend to do a more modest augmentation for several reasons. From an aesthetic standpoint, I think it works better, but also from a physical standpoint, it's just, it's got better long-lasting results. You put a huge implant in, it does two things. Number one is that it stretches the hell out of the skin, and that can damage the skin. It can thin out the breast tissue, and it's heavy. 
So it pulls everything down. It will speed the effects of time, aging, and gravity. So, you know, you're going to get someone who very often they've got a little bit of loose skin. Their surgeon says, hey, we just put a big old implant in there. You won't need a breast lift. You're going to be fine. Well, that, that buys them a year or something, and then it it accelerates the problem that they came there for in the first place. Um, you know, our old chairman, used, my old chairman used to always use the word implant, implant cripple, where, you know, you have someone who you put a gigantic implant in and now they have a huge stretched out, basically envelope of skin that if you ever take that implant out, they're going to look horrible. They're going to look like they, they have just a bag of skin hanging off their chest. Um, and, and lifting that is really difficult in the future. So a lot of problems, but let's balance this because there are some people who simply want a more robust look, or there are some people who let's say have a big frame and you know that something that has a little more oomph is simply gonna balance them better than two little mosquito bites. So it's always a conversation to have with the patient. Have you seen the requests for uh, large implants uh, decrease, increase, or remain static? Um, I have seen it decrease, but this is a question I think we should talk about in the realm of social media. Globally, I think that we have definitely started looking at smaller features in general, smaller boobs, smaller butts, you know, just not as extreme as before. Now that's global. But I think that one of the interesting things about social media right now is no ma it's, it's not like it used to be in, let's say, the 80s, 90s, and early 2000s, where it was only a global trend that pushed everything. Everyone was looking at Pam, and Pam Anderson as like the be-all, end-all, and that's how everyone was. Well, today, because of social media, if you want something, you are going to find your niche for it. You are going to find your community, your people. And so today, as we're looking at, you know, the Kardashians all taking Ozempic, all slimming down, all going in a total 180 from the original direction that steered so many people, well, there are still other communities of very well-known celebrities or whoever who are just rocking that more than ever, you know? And um, so, so it's a mixed bag. And it's interesting. I think that's good. Now we have people that will support you. There are trends that happen in, in all aspects of life. And I think that with breast implants, they became popular when uh, screen uh, and television sirens, the uh, Marilyn Monroe's, Jane Mansfield, Jane, Jane Russell, uh, started showing their f figures. And so women became very interested in breast augmentation in the early 60s when it first was uh, being developed in a, in a more a universal way. And then implants started fading a little way, especially in the early 90s. And then, as you mentioned, Pam Anderson was a big factor in, in having a beautiful figure with large implants and having a positive uh, effect. But like everything else, that trend faded away. And I wonder, as uh, buttock augmentation, uh, perhaps the misnomer of uh, uh, Brazilian butt lift, um, the BBL, which was has become so popular and then pushed by so many different people in, in our profession, you know, has that reached its peak? And are we going to see a downward trend in that? And and are you seeing a, a slightly downward trend now in, in the request for, for buttock augmentation? It, yes. I, I think the numbers... If not are going down, people are coming in with a little bit more of a modest um, desire. But that's also, it's funny, for me, I've sort of built my name on a more natural um, buttock augment augmentation, something that is a little less cartoonish. I still have a lot of my colleagues who have built their names on huge butts, and, and I also see on social media, it's still there. Um, it's hard to gauge, but again, I, and I'm sorry, I'm so, I'm not committed to one, uh, yes or no statement because it's so fluid, but I do think globally, again, in the larger scheme, it's going down and people want more of a natural look. But I think, again, unlike the 
previous decades, having a more prominent butt or at least a more hip to waist ratio, you know, appearance, people that's that's kind of stuck in our minds and people still want that just not so exaggerated to so getting away from that we talked, uh, of the 90s sorry so you know we just talked about two procedures which are really talking about augmenting or adding to uh but one trend right now that has come around again is removing some of the fat in our cheeks, uh, the uh, buckle fat pad uh, removal. Mm -hmm. What's your feeling on that? I do more of it than probably anyone in LA. And um, I, I have done a lot, a lot of it. Um, I am also very careful with it. There is a lot of conversation about the potential of this type of procedure to age you prematurely. Well, you know, there are a couple of thoughts there because number one is that, you know, we've seen that the fat that is associated with facial aging is usually more of the subcutaneous fat in the facial compartments that is separate from this buccal fat um, uh, pad. That's number one. Number two, what I do is I really work hard to select the appropriate person, someone who, despite cracking into 30s, 40s, or so on, they still have just very big cheeks that grandma always wants to pinch, something that's not there. Um, finally, I have a conversation with them about this potential because it has not been appropriately studied, and that study is a really hard one that is, is ongoing. Um, worst case scenario, you can also transfer fat into that area in your 50s, in your 60s, if and when you get a facelift or not. So I do think that is uh, one that requires so much conversation with people, though. You know, you made a very good point there. I, I've been one uh, who's a little bit shy in promoting buckle fat pad removal because I, I do – have that impression that it will age people prematurely. But then as you're saying what you just did, I said, well, wait a second. Almost every facelift that I perform, I'm putting fat in. And Always. so why would, if it became a problem at that point, why not do that? Now, uh, candidly, you, predictability of, of fat transfer to the face isn't 100%. Correct. But there is a tool. So again, if, if patients want that, I guess you do have an option. So again, not something that, that I do, but I, I love hearing kind of a different perspective, which sure. allows all of us to, to make a decision if we, you know, maybe we change courses sometime. Yeah, absolutely. And, and again, on the other side of that, I have to stay open and I really do stay open to the idea of modifying my perspectives. What do you think about, uh, uh, laser resurfacing for the face to get rid of facial wrinkles? I still think it's the best non, non-invasive thing you can do. It's a beast, but I, I think it works better than other things. Now, I also think it's something that should be done by someone who does a lot of it. Um, I think there is so much potential for harm that you got to be really good at it and you got to guide people through it, you know, so working on people with darker skin, terrifying. Um, the potential for other issues, you know, you got to have a practice that is dedicated to it. And, you know, I, uh, I feel like in this town, there are so many good people that you want to be an expert in what you do. And I very happily wipe my hands of that responsibility. It's, uh, you know, for, for the audience, you, you have to understand one thing, that there is not one laser that handles everything. There are lasers that are focused on brown pigment. There are lasers that are focused on red pigment. There are lasers that are focused on uh, getting rid of uh, wrinkles uh, and reducing scars. Uh, and the lasers that are out there are expensive. And oftentimes there are variations of those lasers that are available to practitioners that are not as expensive and yet may not be as dramatic. Sometimes they just don't work. But there are some lasers, if you do your research, uh, that you will find actually have fantastic results. But they are 
scary instruments. Uh, my favorite laser is uh, called a fractionated CO2 laser. It is my workhorse both in my cosmetic practice and in my burn and reconstructive practice because it helps um, uh, improve scarring does not get rid of scarring, helps improve scarring, and it helps significantly improve, improves fine lines and wrinkles. But in doing so, it is really injuring the tissue. Uh, you're hoping it's done in a controlled fashion, and the healing process, the inflammatory process that occurs afterwards, will result in a, a, a more smoother look to the skin. But if you choose the wrong patient, uh, or you choose the wrong settings, or you as a consumer choose the wrong practitioner, it can be disastrous. So I think you hit a very good point is that it is a, it is not something that should be taken cavalierly. Absolutely not. And I, I, honestly, if I can really emphasize one thing that you say, Peter, is if anyone is thinking of using a laser, and I, I tell my patients this, you need to go to someone who does it a lot and someone who has experience with the type of person that you are. You know, I think there are, there are practices that have, let's say, more experience with Asian skin or African American skin or stuff like that. Look at their results. Make sure that they treat people like you and they're comfortable with people like you. Um. Uh, a fair amount of your uh, practice, in addition to uh, body contouring, is also in facial rejuvenation, correct? A, a decent amount, yeah. Is there anything that you feel um, maybe doesn't work as well, or whether, whether it's facelifts or eyelids or brow lifts? Uh, is there anything that you say, yeah, you know what, this... This doesn't work as well as, as, as I would like it to. And I would tell my patients that, you know, you're, yeah, occasionally you'll be, you'll find a good candidate, but it doesn't work for everybody. I, it's a, it's an interesting question. I mean, I think so much of it again is operator dependent. I will say that I know there's something to talk about. I feel like this trend towards using threads has been very damaging for people um, looking for either facial rejuvenation or facial manipulation. I mean, we see so many uh, people in their 20s now who are using these lifts for a little brow lift or a fox eye or something like that. And um, look, at, at best, it works for a little bit. You got to do it again. And, you know, there are a lot of these issues of the thread sticking out or not working or then causing scarring in your face where subsequent procedures like a facelift or whatever are much harder, much more dangerous. Um, I do think there has been a trend towards a more involved and aggressive facelift, towards a deep plane facelift, which uh, shows that, you know, you got to learn how to use the structure of the face. So that deep plane means there are, there are a couple of layers on the face. On the most superficial surface, there is your skin. Deeper to that is a substructure that actually extends all through your body and is that workhorse structure where we pull for arm lifts, for tummy tucks, and especially for facelifts. What people are seeing is the more you manipulate that deeper layer and get under it and pull it back, I think the stronger the result is. Um, but I think there's still that, you know, question of does any technique variability matter because, you know, some people have compared one technique versus the other and they see it's all the same, you know, it doesn't, doesn't make much of a difference. Um, it, I think that's being evolved and I, I'm waiting to see how well that, that more uh, involved approach of deep plane facelifting will, will take over. Yeah, that's a, a a debate that's gone on for a while, even uh, amongst the most academic of uh, surgeons. Uh, uh, there's the one uh, philosophy that by mobilizing the deeper planes, you'll have more longevity and really mobilize the tissue in a more natural way. Um, and then there's others who'll show, yeah, I can do it in a slightly more superficial way. and. Right. Five years later, they all look the same. Yeah. Uh, again, a lot of that is operator dependent too. For sure. Uh, the other other uh, technologies for facial uh, modification uh, include uh, 
something that's been around for a long time called mesotherapy. And one of those forms of mesotherapy was that had some popularity for a while was something called Kybella, uh, where you would be in, injecting um, a, um, a, a chemical structure uh, into the neck and then uh, seeing if that would uh, uh, kind of melt away the fat. Did you have any experience with Kybella? Um, hate it, hate it, hate it. <laughs> Kybella is an incredibly attractive uh, technology for several reasons because what does it do? It allows anybody now, no longer just a surgeon, but any physician or uh, nurse, you know, nurse injector or whatever to start doing body contouring procedures specifically tighten or, you know, reduce fat in the neck. And for Allergan, who was the original one that brought it out, now it's Abdi, um, think about how big of a group they can sell to and say, look, now you can do the same thing that Dr. Gabay has been doing with the liposuction procedure for all these years. Um, it's an interesting technology. I don't want to be too much of a curmudgeon about it. It's interesting in the sense that it's really attractive to be able to just do a couple injections and solve the problem. The problem is this. Number one is that it usually takes multiple injections, uh, multiple you know rounds of injections to make it work to the point that it ends up costing often the same, if not more, as a surgical procedure. Number two, Every single time you do it, many patients will get a fully bullfrog reactive uh, appearance underneath their neck and just hate it. I mean, for, for weeks and sometimes months, their neck is super swollen and inflamed. And, you know, the other thing is it just, it also doesn't work that well and finally leaves a lot of scarring. So I have a lot of people who come to me saying, hey, I did a bunch of Kybella, it didn't work. Now will you do the real thing and operate on me? And when I go in there, it's scarred in like crazy. It's really difficult. It gets a little messy. We still are able to do a good job, but, you know, it's, it's much more challenging. It just never worked. Finally, what a lot of people don't realize, getting back to something we talked about earlier, is that often if someone's neck is big, it's not just because they have fat underneath there, but it's because of loose skin. And Kybella doesn't do a damn thing to treat loose skin. And unfortunately, the people who are using Kybella, again, an internist who's doing cosmetic medicine or a nurse injector or someone, they don't really understand the the implications or the diagnosis even of loose skin because it's not in their wheelhouse it's not in their training whereas for us you know you look at someone you're like hey you got this you got that you got that you got loose skin you got fat you got everything so um have not loved kybella interestingly though i do think it's a nice or good thing to use potentially in other less obvious places kind of looking at like the front bra roll area and someone's a little little more full and, you know, you just want a couple injections, don't want to go through the whole thing. And you can hide that. You don't care if your front bra roll is inflamed for a little bit, such a small amount. Um, so I think you can be creative with it, with it. And again, I don't think you should poo-poo every technology, especially something like this that theoretically, philosophically goes against the more surgical approach that you are used to. You've mentioned uh, Renuvion a little while back. Uh, is there a technology other than that that either currently or things coming down the pipeline that you're excited about that you think, hey, you know, this may be something? You know, Peter, I unfortunately I feel like I'm a little bit outside of the uh, of that developmental world. Um, and so I don't know of much. Um, I do actually feel, though, I mean, I've seen so much, and I still see it. I do feel that radio frequency energy is having a moment, and I don't think that moment is quite done yet. I think people are learning how to refine it and improve it. So I still think that's going to be something there, but I think it's going to be, and I kind of see it, now being incorporated with other technologies. So things like Morpheus are very interesting because what Morpheus does is that it, um, it will have a couple of needles that penetrate the skin, and then while it's penetrating the skin, it shoots in some radio frequency energy. So it 
combines that injury from penetrating the skin with a bolus of energy to shrink things down. Now, there's another uh, device which its name is escaping me. Uh, it, it's it's a bigger uh, piercing of the skin that takes out tiny little cores of the skin that stimulates more inflammation. I I guarantee you they're going to throw in some energy with that soon too and, um, you know, kind of get after that. So I think it's going to be a combination of physical and energy approaches to uh, skin modification. In order for the general public to know about this, uh, marketing has changed from uh, magazines and radio and television to a huge uh, social media uh, presence. And along with that, the practitioners have had to take up a, a big social media presence. And as I talked about earlier, a lot of that is good. I mean, a lot of that uh, brings great education to the patients. It brings uh, a sense of uh, relatability to their uh, their practitioner, whether it be a, a, a nurse injector, an esthetician, or a, a surgeon. And it uh, it makes uh, it, it makes everybody a little bit more close. We can, we can just see everybody, but it also has some negativity to it. It uh, tends to bring out um, a lot of ego. It tends to, we tend to find ourselves wondering how many likes we have or how many followers we have. And why does this person have more followers than I do? And what can I do on social media that will get me more followers that may be a little bit more out there, but it will get me followers based on following me, not necessarily following my procedure. Um, I've hit this point many times in these podcasts that I have some concerns about where we're going in social media. Uh, uh, you've got a big social media presence, but you're pretty classy in the way you you do it. Um, I I haven't seen you yet. You know, you know, take off your uh, gown and do a dance in the OR, um, which always surprises me from some of our colleagues. Um, yeah, I I see some of my dermatology friends putting on more of a fashion show than showing us what they're doing in their uh, in their office. Tell me what your feelings are on social media. Where what's good and and, and what kind of crosses the the border into cringy? So, I think the first answer is be true to yourself. I think, you know, when I started my practice, um I came out, and this was in the very early moments of social media. And, you know, I came out and was, uh, I, I tried to be like, you know, the, the sort of Hollywood surgeon to the stars. I tried to be like the nerdy academic. I tried to be this guy, that guy. And I realized that, number one, it was just ingenuine. Number two, I, the people that I was connecting with weren't my people. You know, it just was a, it was a weird connection. It didn't really work well. But once I started realizing, like, look, just be who you are and, you know, it, it will work better. And it has over the entire evolution from, you know, the early days of Instagram to Snapchat to TikTok to whatever. What I found is this, that the first moment I saw how powerful this was, was probably like, I want to say maybe in 2015, um, I had someone come to my office for a breast augmentation consultation. And, you know, I usually go through a whole spiel about what I do and how I think about it and everything. I started talking and she said, no, 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 no. I've already heard all of this from you on your social media. I like you. I know your kids. I know this. I know that. I'm ready to go. Let's book. Um, and that was amazing because she had the information she knew that she liked me. So it wasn't that interview that, you you know, they come to you in the office and they learn about you. She was ready to go. Um, so that was wonderful. And I've learned over this, you know, these years of being on social media that the more I am my, myself, the more people come into me who see the same way that I do. And that means they have the same expectations I have for surgery. They have the same sort of uh, the expectation of their experience with everything, and we all get along, and it's lovely. Um, I also have seen that, you know, 
there are clearly moments when you know someone comes into your office and you're not the right doctor for them. Like they don't want someone like you. And I'm seeing less and less of that person. And there's nothing wrong with that. I think it's great because they're not wasting their time with someone who they don't want to be with. You know, it's all about finding the right thing. The beauty in this world now is there's so many of us that you can, you can find your right doctor. So social media has allowed us to really, uh, distill who we are and show the world, hey, this is who I am, uh, come and get me, you know? Um, and by that, be, you know, I say that that's important because now there are a lot of people out there who are doing, they're doing the TikTok dance, they're doing the, you know, the memes, they're doing all of the, the TikTok uh, hot things that are out there or whatever. And there is definitely a population who wants that. They want the funny doctor who's kind of a clown and whatever. And, and, and that's okay. Um, I, I, you know, still kind of stick to myself. I've definitely modified how I approach myself on social media, but still trade and stay true to myself. And, and whenever I sway away from that, I feel like such an asshole and it's not right. And the people who see me, know that it's not right. And it's really even worse because it's like you put something out there and it's just crickets of awkwardness, you know? So do your thing. And, you know, I have some friends who are the guys that I cringe at, but they do great and they're happy. So that's the best. Yeah. You know, it is. Everybody's a little bit different. Uh, and some people feel comfortable with that. Um, and it's, um, yeah. I remember a family member a long time ago who said something to me once. It's uh, uh, about taste, and taste is just different in, in different people, and it's just you know, whatever whatever is is okay. But I think that uh, in a world that is competitive, you are in the most competitive area uh, throughout the country, if not the world, and you have as you said, stay true to yourself. Uh, and as importantly, stay true to your patients and done the right thing. Dr. Thank Jabin Gabe, thank you so much for being a part of our podcast today. Thanks for your candor in going through all of these procedures. And we had a whole lot more, but we're running out of time. So uh, those of you who are listening, if you want to ask us about other procedures that you want our opinion on, check us out at uh, beautyandthebspodcast.com and type in your question and we'll try and get around to it. Jabin, thanks so much for joining us. And, uh, and I hope to see you sometime real soon, my friend. Thank you so much for having me. I really enjoyed this. Absolutely look forward to seeing you again soon. Thanks, Peter. All right. That's our episode of Beauty and the BS. Uh, we'll see you next time. Thanks for listening. The Beauty and the BS podcast executive producer is me, Dr. Peter Grossman. Our producers are Max Banta and John Largent, and editing and post-production services are provided by Game Day Media. You can listen to Beauty and the BS wherever you listen to your favorite podcast. And if you'd like to leave a comment or ask me a question, go to beautyandthebspodcast.com and click on the microphone icon and we may use your comment on a future episode. You can also find our archives, video clips, and more on the website as well. Thanks for listening to Beauty and the BS with Dr. Peter Grossman.